Hello everyone. If everything goes well, you can normally already see my screen and hear me well. If that would not be the case, uh, please let me know in the chat box. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the session. My name is uh, Matthias Fahy from Möbius. I'm the sustainability lead at Möbius, uh, currently responsible for, for various projects in this domain, in the sustainability and circular economy domain. Uh, I will be your host for the next hour. Um, I'm responsible currently for different uh, sustainability projects and programs ranging from strategy to su specific sustainability implementations, uh, normally always linked to one of my favorite topic, a topic that we will uh, see coming back in this session also, which is the circular economy. Um, as you can see to the right, uh, Mubius has built up a lot of experience in these types of topics, um, first in sustainability and circular economy transformations in general, first in the, in the Benelux, but then also across Europe and into various other domains also. Uh, my passion for myself goes out to the, to the healthcare and technology value chain, a very challenging value chain, I think, a value chain I like to work in. Um, so to fit with a medical technology company like Barco, which is the case that we will actually cover today, um, was, of, was of course very perfect. Um, next to that, next to presenting myself, I would like to thank the nice people of, uh, of the American Chamber of Commerce in Belgium too for giving us a stage on this interesting topic, uh, of course, also in these, uh, in these challenging times. Um, maybe I would like to start off with, with some logistics aspects to this, to this webinar. You probably will all have some questions at a certain point in time, so don't hesitate to, uh, to put them in the Q&A box. That's actually the chat box, it's not the questions box, and you can see it at, uh, at the bottom of your screen in the GoToWebinar uh, panel. Um, just whenever a question pops up, write it in there, and we will be sure to tackle it uh, at the end of the webinar. We will have 10 to 15 minutes to tackle the most frequently asked questions. Uh, so don't hesitate uh, to drop me a line there. Afterwards, you will also get a copy of the presentation, you will get a recording, you will get a short survey. So uh, there's no need to waste your attention on, on screen cl clippings that in the end will not be clear anyway. We will, of course, send you the slides, no problem. Um, we will also ask you to keep a, a social distance, but I think that nobody is joining together from the same room, so uh, I don't think that that will be a problem. All right, uh, so let's maybe dive into the topic. Um, I thought it was good, as you might have seen in the introduction, also in the invitation, that throughout this webinar, we will share, share some information on, on the sustainability transformation that we executed at a global technology leader called Barco. So I thought that it would be interesting to give you a short heads up on, on who and what Barco is. That uh, In that uh, way, you can, uh, you can understand the content a little bit better that we will be giving. Um, so Barco is a, is a Belgian company, is a Belgian technology company. It's also a listed company. Uh, it's in the Belgian Bell 20 index, so it's quite big. It has it's a little bit more than 1 billion euro in turnover. Uh, and it's, it's active globally uh, with a main footprint in Belgium, the US and China. Um, probably you know Barco more from the three business units that they have. Uh, the first one is entertainment. Entertainment, Barco is responsible for uh, actually cinema projectors. They, uh, they have projectors in, in one in two cinema theaters in the world. So when you go and watch a movie, chances are very high that, that you will be watching it from a Barco projector. Uh, a second important business unit is, is healthcare. Um, Barco makes high-end medical displays for, for diagnostics or, or surgical imaging. Uh, and the last one is enterprise. Uh, Barco helps to helps enterprises to connect, uh, something that we need desperately uh, in these times, I think. Uh, and amongst others, they do it with with a little Barco click share device for wi wireless screen sharing that you might uh, that you might all know. Um, so that's Barco. Uh, but more towards the topic of today, uh, we saw that that Mobius came in to tackle a specific CEO priority. Um, the, the CEO today is Jan de Witte. He took over, I think, in 2017 or in 2016, more or less, from Erik van Zelen. And he expressed uh, his desire to, to move the needle a bit on the sustainability efforts that they were doing. And in five years, he wanted to go from, from lagging or, or even neutral in the field to leading in the field. Um, so that was a specific, specific topic that we wanted to tackle there with this with this project. Um, but let's let's talk about sustainability and, and maybe first of all, I wanted to do a quick question for you, for the audience. Um, I have a question, I'll be, I will be launching a live poll. What are according to you, 
the most significant barriers for a good sustainability strategy in your experience um, or at your organization even? Let me see whether I can launch this poll and let's see whether everything goes well. Normally you should be able to see uh, a little poll now. Um, maybe it's good to select uh, one or two of the of the priorities or the barriers that you feel. Or if you have other barriers, just uh, light them or put them in the chat box and I will be able to see them also. Yeah. Answers are coming in. People are still voting, very good. Yeah, uh, more or less 80% um, answers are still coming in, very, very well. People are still voting, voting, voting. I will close off the poll, 80% of you have voted. Uh, and I will see whether I can share the results of the poll. Yeah, so what we actually see is that um, more than 60% uh, of you think that no clear strategy or goals is the main barrier for you to drive a good sustainability program, something that we see a lot, will also be a very important topic that we will tackle in this webinar. And a close second, uh, an unengaged senior leadership team, something that we see a lot too. Uh, we see that senior leadership, especially them, need to, need to play their role, need to endorse publicly the sustainability vision of, 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 any, uh, of any company that you work in. So uh, indeed, no surprise there that these are the top two uh, top two barriers that we feel. Um, let me see whether I can go back to my screen, whether I can hide these results. Yeah. All right. Because actually, we see this confirmed. And and if you look a little bit at a more objective view, at some research concerning this question. Um, when we look at, at research and surveys concerning the, the probability of success of a good sustainability strategy implementation, we actually see that the number of programs, sustainability programs that meet or exceed expectations is, is very, very low. Only 2% of sustainability programs meet or exceed expectations. Uh, and if you're a little bit, um, a little bit familiar to, to transversal programs in, in companies, then you will really know that this is a very, very low number. If you look at the lean transformation, for example, uh, there the success rate is 20%. So that's 10 times higher than the success rate of a sustainability program. So um, it appears that we are doing something wrong. Um, so we have to um, try to get some insight in what are actually common factors that uh, that make a sustainability program successful what are the common factors of these two percent programs uh, and actually a lot of a lot of smart people have already thought about that we have done some uh, some some proprietary research on that also there is a very interesting bean review on how to achieve break breakthrough results in, in sustainability and actually we see four key success factors always coming back uh, first one something that we saw uh, in the poll also is that um, when, a, when, a, when it's driven by, by a strategy or sustainability program that has clear priorities and that is translated into clear tangible targets and metrics, so actually when it's not fluffy, um, then it can put a boost on your sustainability program. That's number one, key success factor number one. Second one, also not a surprise, is senior leadership endorsement. So we need a senior leadership team to articulate publicly that they are aligned with the sustainability strategy and that they are also willing to take decisions in communication, but also in allocating resources and budgets, for example. Um, two other success factors, but these are already more in implementation. Um, sustainability programs also succeed when there is a clear organizational plan to imp implement, when you have the right governance structure, the right people talking to each other at the right point in time on the right topic, when you have the right decision-making structure, and also actually when you have the right culture in place, because we see when employees are engaged, and that's topic number four, they also know how to apply the sustainability strategy in their own line of work. And then you know that you can really, that you can really advance. Um, of course, this is still quite high level, I know, um, but for me, it stands out and it's, it's, a, it's a very big learning that these success factors are the same for other transversal programs that might run in your organization. So um, actually, 
leading to manage a sustainability program is not that much different than lead, leading a lean transformation or a digitization effort. Uh, but still we see that many organizations are still approaching sustainability programs, whether it's in a bank, in a manufacturing company, in a services company, or in a public organization, as something completely, completely different. But actually there's no need, no need to do that. All right. Um, so let's get down to, to business. Um, I've broken down some things that we've learned and applied at Barco in three chapters, more or less three quests that we needed to overcome, that we needed to accomplish. And this is also the agenda for today. We have quest number one, is sustain sustainability strategy and metrics, something you've, you've identified as a, big, as a big pain point. Quest number two is defining the program into an impact roadmap. Quest number three, we will touch upon shortly is hardwiring sustainability. I didn't choose the term implementation of sustainability, but really hardwiring. It will become clear why I did that. And we will end with some key takeaways and some, uh, some Q&A. All right, let's take a look at the first quest. Let's take a look at strategy. What does a holistic and, and complete sustainability strategy actually look like? Uh, and I've decided to, to use a visual, uh, a key visual that we've used a lot at Barco that you can also find in their sustainability report. Um, and this is a visual that we've used to visualize the sustainability strategy. Uh, first of all, question number one that your sustainability strategy needs to answer is actually what you will be doing for the coming years. And you see that Barco wants to focus on three things, on planet, reducing the environmental impact of the company, Focus on people, encouraging sustainable employability, and focus on communities. Go for a thriving community of Barco stakeholders. Uh, altogether, these three focus domains do not provide yet a good focus that a good strategy needs. Um, it's very important that you go one level deeper and that you define per, per focus domain what the explicit focus items, relevant topics, will be for your organization. And for example, and actually that, that means that you have to answer first not what you will be doing, but also how you will be doing it, how you will be um, reaching effect in a certain domain. For example, for planet, if you look at planet, we identified that um, for Barco, it will be very important to focus on reducing the carbon footprint, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, of the use phase of their products. Uh, um, and circular economy. We've identified a big focus on circular economy as one of their material topics. Um, there is a clear case on why from the planet domain we chose we choose uh, these two items, these two specific items. 90% uh, of climate impact is in the use phase of their devices because they are a very energy consuming devices that they bring to the market. So it's clear, it's logical that we try to uh, focus on that. Secondly, why circular economy? Because Barco is a high value, high quality equipment manufacturer. So the value chain, the Barco value chain, is very prone to various circular economy business models, something that will become clear in, uh, in the remainder of this webinar. Um, so we chose um, not only to... Uh, oops, my screen is shifting. I don't know what's happening. I hope that uh, this is fine again. Yeah. Um, so we chose uh, some specific topics to focus on. Um, of course, the million dollar question is, how do you identify not only in planet, but also in people and communities, the top, the four or five top focus items to put your money on the coming years? Um, so I wanted to give you some insight in how we went about, um, because it's important that you align the organization on these focus topics, and that, um, because that will, that will build a lot of confidence, I think, with both internal and internal, internal and external stakeholders. Um, actually, we see that that good organization, a good sustainability strategy definitions definition actually combines different methods to to grasp, to seek out information from the market to allow you to um, identify very important topics, important topics, and just the topics that you need to jump the bar on. And that is very important. Um, actually, we see that a lot of organizations stick to the stakeholder management approach. They ask their stakeholders what stakeholders think is important for the company and they, they put it in a nice matrix, a materiality matrix we call that, and then the, the job is done. Um, actually, I would like to add a couple of interesting other sources of information that you can use as the basis for your sustainability strategy exercise. Um, the first one is benchmarking. I suggest trying to get a lot of insight 
um, and what other organizations find important. I found it very interesting to take a look at the sustainability policy of the most important Barco reference clients, for example. Take a look at what your client finds important and try to reflect on who, how you can align your sustainability strategy on that strategy, how you can help your clients achieve their sustainability targets. It helps you to link sustainability directly to your core business. For example, Philips, the medical technology company, was a very important client of Barco. So we tried to reflect as much as possible and try to incorporate as much as possible um, the important topics that Philips thought was important. Bar uh, Philips has a very big circular economy focus, so we tried to uh, try to enable that, of course, also. Um, I also thought it was interesting to take a look at, at other um, peers, I call it, not only direct competitors, but also companies that we identify ourselves with in the market. Take a look at their sustainability reporting, their sustainability strategy, and think about what they, uh, what they find important. Last but not least, I think, um, concerned to benchmarking. Um, the last few years, I've also seen that a lot more reporting and transparency has, has emerged and has gotten more mature. So I would suggest to also try to get into relevant networks that can give you loads of, of structured information, like the Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, for example, Sustainalytics, MC, MSCI. These are all investor-related databases that screen a lot of different customers, a lot of different organizations in a certain sector. So if you if you integrate yourself in that kind of network, use the structured information that they have, you get a lot of good knowledge on what for your sector are important sustainability issues today. Um, so they provided, for me at least, a lot of guidance in, um, in prioritizing sustainability items. Um, something that I would also like to add uh, is the last bullet. I also suggest taking a very critical look at your value chain and trying to measure where your biggest impact is and align your sustainability strategy to that impact. Uh, and one of the things that we used extensively uh, in Barco was actually the, the, the company level CO2 footprint and also some specific product specific life cycle analysis of reference products. Um, this is what, what the, the, the um, CO2 profile of Barco looks like. As you can see, end user emissions, that means the emissions of our products at the customer, so actually the energy footprint of our product, is responsible for 90% of the, of the CO2 footprint of Barco. That's why um, one of the things that we did immediately was set up an eco-design program geared towards energy efficiency, because that's where our biggest impact is. But also when we looked at Barco's own direct emission, so the purple, the purple bar, um, we saw that a lot of our direct impact was actually in logistics. Yeah? More than 80% of our own impact was in our supply chain, how we manage our logistics. So the first thing we also did was set up a supply chain project to reduce the carbon impact that our logistics have. Um, so trying to put a little bit of numbers on the table, trying to analyze the value chain objectively, also gives you a lot of direction or hints on where you need to focus to. Um, so to conclude, um, stakeholder wishes and asking stakeholders what they find important for your organization, still very relevant, but try to, um, try to complement it with other relevant information, try to measure yourself, try to benchmark, um, but also ask yourself the question that the fourth bullet, how it helps you to win in the market, how sustainability can be positioned as a strategic winner in the market, because it's only then that you can get a senior leadership on board. And we all saw in the poll uh, that an unengaged senior leadership team is one of the critical barriers to implementation. So trying to get trying to give them insight and in how it can help them win the market, I think for sustainability strategists, for sustainability manager is key. Um, I do have another example for that. I will, I will not go into Barco for this, but I will, I will take an example from a totally different sector, from the chemical sector. Uh, I would like to go in on the sustainability strategy of Solvay to, uh, to show you how integration of a business and sustainability strategy can actually work because I see that a lot of companies write on their website, website that they have an, an integrated sustainability strategy. 
Um, I don't really know what that looks like, but I know that the, the, the sustainability strategy that Solvay has launched recently is a very good example. Um, actually, when we when we take a look at Solvay, uh, end of February, so it's very held off the needle, uh, February 26th, they launched their comprehensive sustainability strategy. They call it the Solvay One Planet strategy. Yeah. Um, but in also one breath, and you can see it in, in the press release, they explicitly link it to their corporate strategy. So the corporate strategy is called the GROW strategy. Um, and that's actually an acronym, GROW. Um, GROW stands for um, stands actually for four key strategic pillars that Solvay has. And the first one is materials to accelerate growth. Um, that's the first one. And it's in this pillar that Solvay explicitly refers to sustainability. They explicitly state that they want to be present in the business of specialty polymers and composite materials. And these are exactly the materials that, ad that address the current day sustainability needs of their clients. Plus, this is the segment with the highest margin and the highest growth. So they explicitly say that a good sustainability policy will help them to win in these markets, which I think is key for an integrated business strategy and sustainability strategy, when you can position and you can show how a sustainability focus will help you drive um, financial results and also market leadership. I think that is something that Solve uh, shows shows very well. Um, I would like to stay on this example a bit more because I think it's it's interesting. If you look under the hood of the sustainability strategy of Solve and other best practice for me emerges, um, Solve makes their strategy quite actionable already towards the right level and this is public information you can all surf towards the website of Solve and try to get get to the bottom of this actually Solve one planet which is their sustainability strategy is comprised of, of three big focus domains a little bit comparable to the ones of Barco it's climate resources and better life this does not provide enough focus it's just um, an umbrella to position your sustainability topics under uh, and actually, uh, Solvay has 10 tangible goals that they want to reach, 10 tangible goals. One of them is lowering greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. And they um, make every goal measurable with a target, because that's a best practice, and they translate it into different key levers. And here you can see an example how they want to, how they want to achieve the key target of lowering the carbon footprint of Solvay. Um, they have identified six big key levers and a key lever can be an aspiration can be a system can be a bigger project uh, it will not surprise you it's a chemical company so energy efficiency energy intensity the move to renewable energy is very very visible and present here yeah so uh, a, a nice uh, a nice list of actionable levers um on how on, on how they will uh, achieve their sustainability strategies for so for me uh so that already looks uh, very much on how a formal sustainability program uh, can and should look like, right? Um, that's immediately a nice, a nice bridge to to, call, to quest number one. Uh, quest number two. Um, it's important that that your sustainability focused items are also grouped into a program, and that they are managed according to to best practices of, of program management, uh, which means that we have to add some program management essentials to it. Um, I'm talking about clear goals and metrics, accountability for objectives, and of course, like we see here, a, a good roadmap with the right interdependencies between different projects. Um, so I would like to focus brief, briefly on the, on the road mapping part, uh, again by focusing on, uh, on various Barco examples. So let's make it, make it tangible. If we looked at, uh, at Barco, um, we actually saw that we needed to advance in three critical areas when we wanted to um, actually elevate the sustainability level of Barco. Um, the first years, we mainly looked at three critical processes to lower our environmental footprint, because that was key for us in the first, first two or three years. Um, we saw that we needed to lower our logistics footprint as part of our supply chain management backbone. We saw that we needed to advance on sustainable product development. We wanted to advance the level of sustainable products that we were pushing into the market, but we didn't want to only push products anymore. We saw that services and circular economy, so how we valorize and manage products once they are in the field, also their end of life, 
became much more important for us. So we also defined a strategic project on services and circular economy. Um, these are three big items we wanted to tackle. And I will try to, um, from a helicopter perspective, we cannot cover all details, but give you a short insight in how we tried to tackle this. All right, let's let's take a look at, um, at supply, chain, supply chain management. Um, actually, what our objective there was the first year is to come to an initial roadmap of supply chain initiatives we could take to lower the carbon footprint of our logistics activity. Um, the first thing that we did there, and that was crucial, uh, is to the left. We tried to map, first of all, and get objective insight in how carbon intensive our supply chain actually was and where the carbon in our, in our supply chain actually was. Um, we know that supply chain managers usually know their network from a cost or an inventory perspective very well, but we saw that they do not know how it behaves from a carbon perspective. So know, uh, knowing between what countries you have the biggest carbon impact, what products you have flowing through these lines, um, how, uh, how carbon intensive any of these lines is, was very, very interesting for us to see. So we made a very good objective analysis first uh, on which products uh, flow on which lines and where the carbon impact is. Um, of course, it's important to get some insight uh, to get into, it's important to get some insight in, in the supply chain network. Um, but of course, we also need to decide on what carbon reduction measure will we actually implement. And for me, it's important to know, and that's on the right, that we needed to get an insight on what are carbon reduction measures that we have today. And actually, we saw that there are basically, as the standard menu is known. Um, you either eliminate miles by, for, for example, local sourcing, or you optimize transport by dematerial dematerializing products, for example, making them way less or, or having less volume, or you decarbonize by, for example, modal shifting from air transport to, to, to deep sea transport, for example. For me, the biggest crux, the biggest challenge was, how do you map the exact correct carbon reduction measure to the right part of your supply chain, uh, to the right lane of your supply chain, I would say. Uh, because if you don't do this well and you start applying carbon reduction measures randomly in your supply chain, chances are very high that or the supply chain manager or the CFO will break your supply chain road, roadmap immediately. Um, so that for us was crucial in trying to tackle the supply chain, um, trying to, to tackle the supply chain challenge, get insight in the, uh, in the carbon intensity of the, of the network and try to map um, in a business relevant way, the right carbon reduction measure that reinforces the business and not contradicts the business. Yeah. Um, if you want more information on that, I would suggest that you go to the blog of one of my, my dear colleagues, Bram de Smet, who wrote a good blog on how to apply sustainability to the supply chain triangle. Here you can find a lot more examples and a lot more, a lot more cases on this. Yeah. A second thing, was of course the big the big backbone of of Barco. Barco is a, is a is a product development company with a strong engineering backbone. So product development, new product introductions was very important for them. Um, people with a lot of power in the organization also worked in that process. So changing something there was was very hard. Um, but still, we wanted to tackle that challenge because we knew that a lot of the environmental impact that the company has is in the products that they manufacture and put on the market. Um, and the biggest question that we wanted to tackle there was actually how can we increase the sustainability performance or the environmental performance of our product portfolio? Uh, again, this was, a, this was a big challenge to tackle. So I broke it down into two parts that we tried to do. Um, to the left, um, first of all, what we tried to do was go into some, some form of sustainable portfolio management. Um, first, we, first of all, we invested some time in defining what for us, for Barco, a, stain, a sustainable product actually means, what that means. Uh, and for that, uh, we defined objective criteria uh, that we used throughout the organization to assess the sustainability impact of products. We look at material use, energy efficiency, packaging, and end-of-life management. Um, and this becomes a very powerful tool um, because it it makes people talk the same language and all of a sudden a lot of things become comparable 
what we tried to do was that every new product development gets an eco score, an eco label. You know whether your new product development is a D and how you can elevate it to a C, or you know when it's an A and what makes it an A. So that's kind of an eco label and a sustainable portfolio management tool that we implemented there. And this becomes very powerful when you can also link business objectives to that. Um, for example, one of, the, one of the business objectives of Barco was that in the next decade, they only want revenues from A-class solutions and gradually um, improve the sustainability performance of the full portfolio, um, which is of course a very powerful metric if your senior management can endorse that. Um, this is, for example, also a common practice in the chemical industry already. Solvay has the SPM tool, BASF has the sustainability, uh, the sustainable solution steering methodology. These are all very comparable um, sustainable portfolio management tools. Um, for me, very important to build common, a common knowledge on what a sustainable product is and also to link targets to, because we saw that as also one of the, of the success factors. Uh, afterwards, uh, and that's to the right, we also invested a lot of time in putting together support for designers, product managers, engineers, people that are actually involved in, yeah, what, what will the product actually look like that we put on the market? Uh, first of all, we helped to build eco-design skills, but afterwards we also invested time in building a suite of eco-design tools, different tools that designers, product managers can use to get inspiration, to analyze products, to uh, get some numbers in and get a result out, um, to compare, etc. cetera. Um, it's amazing how many of these tools you can already find online, um, but that would be a subject of, of, of on its own. So, so I would suggest to, to, to um, organize another webinar on that a bit later. Um, but maybe to, to, to top off with, with a nice example, uh, you can find a lot of information in the Barco Sustainability Report on this. Um, both on how we eco-label and what factors are taken into account, but also some nice examples. This is, for example, the eco-design evaluation of a Barco ClickShare device, um, probably a device you, you all have in your meeting rooms, or some of you might have. Uh, and actually, a lot, of these, um, a lot of these examples are worked out, also a projector, also a diagnostic display, are worked, on, are worked out in the sustainability report of Barco. So uh, click on the link uh, on the bottom of this slide to get into more, into more details on how sustainable design and circular design, how it can work in a, in a B2B context. Yeah. Um, maybe a last point, one of the biggest uh, challenges for us to tackle uh, was the circular economy. Circular economy is a very broad topic, is a very big topic, is a topic that has been booming the past few years, I would think. Um, so actually, when you look at circular economy, for us, the main hurdle, for us, the main, uh, for us, the main nut to crack was how to implement this topic, how to make this topic relevant um, for a company like Barco. But we saw that it was, it was really relevant. We wanted, we, we saw that actually Barco, for various strategic reasons combined, the transition from a linear to a circular company seemed very relevant. They wanted to move from a pure hardware company to a services company. They were positioned as a high value, high quality manufacturer, which is in line with, with circular economy business models like remanufacturing product as a service. Plus we saw that a lot of clients also had a very big appetite to consume in circular economy business models. For example, consume on demand or consume as a service. So we saw that the circular economy was a very welcome framework for us because we saw that it connected very well to what senior leadership thought was important um, and because again we think that that is a crucial success factor we jumped on this topic and we tried to make it very um, tangible for the company um, for people that are not very much acquainted with the circular economy uh, very short a circular economy as opposed to a linear take make uh, and dispose economy uh, aims for organizations to build business models around longer lasting products or around the recapturing of components and materials. Um, the good thing is that these business models are good for the pocket of the shareholder and for our environment if you implement it well. Um, so actually we thought that this was very important for us at Barco to implement 
Um, if you want some more information on the circular economy, I would suggest um, you take a look at our website or the website of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who provide a lot of interesting resources on this topic um, to, go, to go a little bit more into detail. Actually, you see that the circular economy has different uh, different types of business model that you business models that you can venture into business models based on recycling on parts harvesting on remanufacturing on lifetime extension and the more you go to the heart of the butterfly model of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation the more sustainability impact you have and you can see it to the right also the 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 higher the profit potential is that you have the heart uh, not to crack was how to implement this very big concept into a company like Barco. Um, and actually, I wanted to pinpoint um, some of the success factors that we felt um, when implementing the circular economy in a global company with different business units listed on the stock exchange, etc. So not, not the easiest environment to work in. The first thing that we saw as crucial uh, was to build conviction. Build conviction um, internally and prove that the circular economy actually is a business relevant framework. Uh, and we think that the best way to do it was to, to make sure that you have key functions convinced, functions like strategic marketeers, like product managers, like business unit managers. And you need to really show how it can build business benefits and how it is relevant in a business context. Um, and the best thing that always works is to link it to how it works in a similar value chain. What we try to do a lot is build inspiration by learning from similar similar cases. Um, moving from uh, learning from similar cases, so we, we built a lot of inspiration on that. But we also shared a lot of successes that we uh, that we booked at Barco at the beginning, um, because otherwise people always have the feeling that it works in another um, it works in another company, but it won't work in my company. So building internal conviction, tailored to the specific target audience of strategic functions um, is important. The second thing that I also learned was to make sure that we don't narrow circular economy down to waste management or recycling. Uh, circular economy is very linked to the business contexts. So it was very important also to, um, to show how circular economy can drive new business and how it, how it can drive innovation. And afterwards, it's, it's, it's time to get started. We started off with um, small and fast with pilot projects. We asked every division, and we had three, uh, in the first year already to experiment with small-scale pilot projects regarding the circular economy, or small-scale remanufacturing, or parts harvesting, or offering a certain product line as a service to try to learn a lot. Um, and then I will skip to bullet five, learning with pilot projects also um, also got us gave us a lot of insights in how we should approach circular economy projects and actually we see that 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 the main building blocks of a successful circular economy project were very clear in all the pilots that we ran we had to think of the business model how to how to get money out of it we had to think about a proper circular strategy is it recycling is it remanufacturing is it straightforward reuse Plus, we had to think about implementation, value chain design. In a lot of circular economy business models, you cannot handle it alone. So you need the right partnership. Plus, and then I link to uh, the product development part that we already tackled before, you have to, in a lot of cases, also optimize or adapt your product for it. Um, so, so these pilot projects gave us a lot of insight in how to manage um, these circular economy projects. What I also thought was interesting is, is number four, bullet four, was engaging yourself in world-class networks. There are a lot of um, interesting, um, interesting and leading knowledge networks on the circular economy. I'm talking about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I'm talking about circular economy from the Netherlands. Um, they all have very, very interesting resources um, and they also provide a very strong network. They help you to challenge yourself. They help you to uh, exchange inspiration and cases. They help you with resources. So don't, um, don't withhold yourself from engaging in the right network for you. Yeah. Um, all right. 
So that was it for circular economy. If, if you want some more insight in what circular economy is, already refer, I already referred to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We also have a lot of interesting resources on the Mobius website or on YouTube. Um, last year, we did a case uh, for a Belgian lighting equipment manufacturer transforming their current sales model to a circular business model, a lighting as a service business model. Um, we had a webinar on that last year. You can rewatch it on YouTube. Uh, you can see the link on your screen or you can just read up um, you can read up on it in the case that is also uh, visualized at the at the at the end of the page here yeah so some things for you to to get some more insight in how the circular economy can work can work practically yeah um, there are even organizations that have made a very nice standard out of it uh, apparently people cannot get enough bsi uh, is an organization that likes to build standards across industries and they have, they've developed a general standard for organizations to implement, to make them transition from a linear to a circular economy. Uh, through the, the link um, at the back, you can, uh, you can see what, uh, you can actually purchase the standard, right? Okay. Um, okay, uh, let's take a, a short look at quest number three, hardwiring sustainability. We already talked about strategy. We already talked, a bit on implementation, on how to, from a content perspective, build a good roadmap uh, and take a look at a practical perspective, how to tackle three processes. Um, I would like to generalize a bit now, and I would like to go into hardwiring sustainability because it's really the key, the key of implementation. And actually what we learned from other transversal projects, big transversal transformation in, in companies, is that you need to get your organization on board. Yeah? Um, for me, it was important that apart from having a good strategy, apart from having the right metrics and projects, you also need systems. You need some very good organizational systems that will drive sustainability decisions and behavior. Actually, what you want is that every role in the organization is impulsed, is actually inclined, to take the right decision based on all information um, and to make sure that all the individuals have this information, that they have the right impulses. Actually, we will use systems and the systems um, perspective is something that we borrow from the Shingo model. And the Shingo model is a, is a company model on how to guide sustainable transformations. Um, sustainable, not from an environmental point of view, but from a time perspective. Um, and actually, if you look at um, and maybe I would like to give this example. This is an example of a carbon uh, pricing system, which is actually a nice example of a system that can work very well. Carbon pricing means that you put a price on carbon, a price that is not that visible in a lot of companies. Actually, that is a system. It's a system that helps you incorporate sustainability information in day-to-day -day decisions. And it makes sustainability part of the normal decision-making process, like any other economic cost. A carbon price means that you try to monetize, valorize your carbon impact and try to also include it in investment decisions, in product development, or in general business casing. So for me, that's a nice example of a system to drive sustainable decision-making by just making sure that every that all information is on the table to make a correct decision on. But if you look more from an organizational perspective, there are for me five key systems that you want to implement to come to a world-class sustainability program implementation. I have them lined up here for you, five of them. First one is performance management to drive accountability, governance structure, a timely and structural stakeholder feedback system, internal engagement, and some kind of certification and awarding actually an external challenging mechanism. We don't have time to tackle them all. Um, I would like to tackle, because I see that we're already um, almost at the end. Um, I would like to maybe tackle the first one, uh, is performance management to drive accountability, because I saw also at Barco that that was a key, a key system to advance on. Actually, what we say is that it is important when you want to, um, you want to assure results and you want to get into that 2% um two percent threshold of sustainability programs that succeed you actually need a very good performance management system you need it at the level of the organization and at the level of the individual actually this means 
that you want to make your sustainability strategy actionable into the right metrics and cascade them down into your organization. You want to do it at the level of the organization. And there we see, uh, again, from a Bain survey, that you want, on company level, you want bold targets, you want stretch targets. And, and this is an, an interesting one. You want to communicate these publicly because then other stakeholders can see whether you progress, can see whether they are ambitious and can also challenge you. That's, that's number two. And last but not least, you want them to be strategically relevant. Yeah? So you want these metrics, these sustainability metrics to be in line with business objectives. Yeah? A good example here, two examples. To the left from Barco, uh, the third, uh, the third metric, the 25% metric, is a very good metric, sustainability metric, in line with business objectives. There we say that we wanted 80% of new products developments to be eco-scored, so to um, to follow the process of eco-scoring. Plus, by 2020, we wanted one in four new products developments to be in the A class. So this is really a good strategically relevant sustainability target that will drive the right decisions in product development and that will drive the right behavior. So for me, a perfect met metric to be in a performance management system for sustainability. Philip goes e Philips to the right goes even further. Philips links eco-design targets to financial targets. They say we have a target of 70% of green revenues we have a target of 15% of circular revenues. When you can link sustainability to financial metrics, you know that you will have um, you, ha you have great power in the organization to shift and to make decisions to uh, to really attain those two types of targets. Yeah. So for me, um, very very interesting to to invest in performance management or the or on the organizational level, but also cascade it down uh, to the individual level to individual accountability. Um, and that's very important to get key functions on board with your sustainability program. Uh, and if you look at the example of Solvay, I've put uh, another screen cap there, and I've highlighted there, for example, the, the last one, metrics on greenhouse gas emissions of operations in senior management remuneration. So we see that uh, the senior management team of Solvay has explicit targets in their own development plan with respect to sustainability. That is for me crucial if you want to drive the right behavior and the right decisions, that you also make people individually accountable, not only senior management, but I would prefer also one level deeper in the organization. And for people that are paying a lot of attention, you also see that the example that I gave, a carbon pricing scheme is also one of the biggest levers that, uh, that Solvay is implementing to lower greenhouse gas emissions worldwide so that was it for um, for the for the systems perspective um, let me go back to um, to the top because we still have 10 minutes left so i would like to go into um, i would like to go into some questions um, i see that somebody has asked um, i will go to maybe the q a page yeah um, one of the questions that somebody posted in here, let me see. Uh, what does a good governance structure for um, organizations look like? And is, it, is there one ideal governance structure to work in? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Let me maybe go back to the slide I have on that. Yeah, this one. Um, yeah, so, so the question is on governance. Um, so for the people that, that are not really familiar with that, governance means um, how do you make sure that the right people in the organization talk to each other on the right topics and with the right frequency? It's basically how do you build your organizational structure around sustainability? Um, maybe I would like to tackle the second part of the question first. Uh, the question of the of the attendee was: Is there one uh, optimal organizational structure for sustainability? Um, I think not. Uh, it depends very much on the complexity of the organization. If you have a lot of layers, you will have a complicated organizational structure around sustainability. Um, but also a very big difference for organizations is um, 
where the sustainability function is situated. And I would suggest so some, some organizations put it under investor relations, some put it under innovation, some put it under marketing. Um, I would suggest aligning that, aligning the position of the sustainability management function or the program office, align it with your main priority. If your main priority is in circular economy and product development, you should put it under the innovation function. When your most important topic is marketing and communication, you should put it under, under that function. Um, so try, trying to align with the, with the function or the area where you as sustainability want the most impact and I think is key there. And that will also be reflected in your, in your organizational structure. Um, so that's, that's number one on the, on, on, on the optimal organizational structure topic. Um, and that was also uh, the, the first bullet on the slide actually here. Um, the second thing I think is not to make it too complex. Um, this is, for example, the, the governance structure, the organizational structure that we implemented in Barco. Um, I think your sustainability structure should be fit for purpose, dependent upon the level where you want to be in. Um, for example, we, of course, we had represent, representation in the executive team, in the core leadership team. We used the core leadership team um, to get feedback and to follow up on results, and we, we needed them to steer but we were not frequently that frequently i think one time per quarter or in the beginning one time per month even we were represented in the executive committee um, but sustainability was uh, a fixed agenda point on every executive team meeting so that was an interesting tip to take away with to take away um, to make sure that um, the topic stays top of mind always of course we also had a program uh, function to assure the drive, to make sure that we monitor, that we that we have progress. Um, in a lot of organization, this will be a, a single sustainability manager. If you have a bigger organization, that will be a manager and some, uh, yeah, and some team members that can be a program office. Um, I think it's also key um, that you try to align as good as possible. That's the fourth bullet with um, with the different functions that you need to work with. I think you will. In every organization, you will have some key functions that you really want to integrate very well. Um, I think working with some kind of, of ambassador meeting, we called it, uh, but it's not really the correct term, but we always had a cross-functional meeting too, um, frequently to make sure that everybody is aligned on where we have progress, where not, where we need to escalate, that we can learn from each other, etc. A very big tip, I think, from a governance perspective, uh, is the last one I put on the slide is making sure that you don't pick up too much work from your sustainability management function or from your program office. Execution should always be embedded in the business um, with workstream leaders, with project leaders. But as a as a sustainability manager, you should be coordinating, and you should be not you should not be executing yourself uh, a lot of content specific uh, work packages. Um, let's see, maybe another another question. We still have have five minutes left. Um, one of the questions is: Do you have specific examples of circular economy business models that were very uh, relevant for for Barco? I think that's also a good question. I think I will go to to the slide to help me a bit, yeah, because we we tackled this topic quite uh, quite fast. Um, if we look at Barco, um, like I said, they have three very big uh, business units, entertainment, healthcare, and enterprise. Um, the circular economy is easier to implement when you have a high value and high quality products with a long lifetime. A high value, um, what do I mean with that? A high value means expensive. Uh, in a lot of cases, a high product cost or a high market price. Um, why? Because it's typically these kind of appliances that can bear remanufacturing, that can bear a take back cost. Um, so, so actually we saw that in the entertainment pillar, circular economy business models were very strategically relevant and actually also a little bit easier to implement or easier to identify, I would say, than in the other divisions. And for example, for cinema projectors, um, we looked at specific circular economy business models based on 
um, repair of certain um, certain critical um, certain critical uh, components, and we were also looking in a more um, far-fetched, but a more um, a more I would say disruptive product as a service business models be business model based on remanufacturing of uh, of cinema projectors. So the most important circular economy business models there were of course not in the recycling or the straightforward reuse loop. So we were not in really the outer loops, if you can follow it on my screen, but we were more in the inner loops where we could recapture a lot of material value and where we could make a very strong business case. Yeah. Um, so I would say that we were more in the, in the heart of the butterfly model. All right. Um, I'm going to um, leave it to that. I'm going to go to the last part of my presentation. Um, I just wanted to summarize some important key takeaways um, because we gave a lot of information, I think, in this webinar. Um, for me, the four key elements was that, that today we see that sustainability programs that meet or exceed expectations, the percentage is very low, 2%. Um, the biggest reason I see is that people or organizations are managing sustainability programs in a totally different way than other organizational programs, um, but there's no clear reason to do that. I think the fundamentals of good program management have to be applied to sustainability programs, drive it with a key strategy and actionable targets, integrate it into the business strategy like Solvay does, and try to make an actionable impact roadmap, trying to single out a couple, three to four key processes like we did with product development, with supply chain management, with circular economy, identify these ones and put them in a very good roadmap. Um, I think strategy is about focus and not about breadth. Um, choose the key topics wisely that you want to tackle because you cannot tackle everything at the same time. It will, uh, it will extract a lot, of, a lot of credibility out of your program, I think, if you try to, to tackle everything at once. Um, strategy is not only about, about projects and metrics, it's also about driving the right culture and decision making. Um, use well-defined systems to guide decisions and behavior. And I think one of the most important systems that you have is a very good performance management system with sustainability targets cascaded throughout the organization, I think is key. But really take a look at, at the slides of the other systems too, or ask me for more information uh, through mail. I would be happy to give some, uh, some information on other systems that you can use also. Um, and then the last thing, uh, we also had a question on that was, was use a solid governance structure to steer the program, get feedback and build a burning platform. It's essential to get the right people talking about sustainability at the right point in time with the right other people, I think, with the right frequency. Um, so we also put a lot of effort in designing the right, uh, the right governance structure. Um, so this was it for me. Um, I would like to close off with, with maybe some, some more information. If you want some more background material, um, you can find a lot of uh, interesting resources on the Mobius website. I think the American Chamber of Commerce in Belgium also launched, um, I think today, one of our articles on world-class sustainability implementation. Be sure to read up on that. Uh, if you want some more hot off the needle news, um, go follow our LinkedIn page. There you can find daily and weekly updates on what, uh, what is happening in the field of sustainability and circular economy. Um, in the meantime, don't hesitate to contact me directly um, or to, uh, to wait for the presentation and the recording that will be coming your way. Um, I hope everybody had a good time. Um, I hope it was interesting. And of course, I also hope everybody to stay safe at home for the coming period. And I wish you a lot of success in the coming sustainability challenges. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.